In 1936, only three years before the outbreak of World War II, Germany was heavily reliant on the small and ineffective Panzer I. It was little bigger than a modern family saloon car. But in 1939, 1,200 were in frontline service, and they formed the bulk of Germany's tank forces. The Panzer I is really hardly worth considering as a fighting tank. It was designed originally for training. It just had a couple of machine guns in its turret. And apart from reconnaissance, you wouldn't dare send it out against other tanks. The majority of them were therefore converted to the sort of command tank role. And the purpose of a command tank is really just to provide transport for a battalion commander in the field. In other words, he can go out with his troops in their tanks, he can keep contact with them on the radio, but he's in a vehicle that will match theirs across country and gives him roughly the same sort of protection. The thing's fitted with a machine gun if he really gets into a sticky situation, but he's not meant to be fighting, he's meant to be keeping an eye on the situation and an ear and commanding his troops in action. In the space of three short years, German tank technology would progress from the lightweight and inefficient Panzer I to the mighty Panzer VI, the Tiger, the most complete fighting vehicle of the war. As an example of evolution, the transformation from the Panzer I to this made the animal kingdom look positively static. Adolf Hitler was the man who provided the impetus to develop the tanks of Germany's Wehrmacht. Hitler was a gambler and he gambled upon bluffing his enemies into believing his tank forces were far stronger than they actually were. When Hitler precipitated the Second World War with his invasion of Poland in 1939, his tank forces were questionable at best, but the gamble succeeded by the application of a new tactical doctrine. Blitzkrieg, championed by General Heinz Guderian. Against Poland, the German command discovered a number of things which were very important. A, they didn't have the right kind of tanks. Uh, Mark I's and Mark II's were undergunned. And the second thing they discovered was you can let the tanks run as fast as you like. Uh, I think uh, Seven Panzer Division covered about 140 miles in a week, but it runs out of fuel. So what are you going to do about that? And also tanks uh, need maintenance. Uh, the other thing they discovered was that their artillery, the artillery support was horse-drawn. Well, obviously, the rate of advance between a horse and a tank is rather different. The other thing they discovered was that their motorized division was really much, much too cumbersome. So the Germans learned a great deal from uh, Poland. And the, the final lesson they learned was this, do not use tanks in a city. At the end of the 19th century, when he proposed his theory of evolution, Charles Darwin noted that there were many branches which led to unsuccessful species, and hence to extinction. Of course, Darwin was talking about animals, but tanks, it would seem, followed exactly the same rules. In 1939, it was understood that tanks in the coming war would need to be able to deal with two kinds of different situations. The first was tank versus tank actions. Tanks are designed to survive explosions, even very close or directly upon the vehicle. Faced with the armor of a tank, explosive power alone is of little value. To destroy a tank, it is necessary to fire a shell fast enough to penetrate the hull and kill the men inside. Provided the target was close enough, the armor of most tanks of 1939 and 1940 vintage could be penetrated by relatively small caliber anti-tank weapons, such as the 50 mm gun which equipped these Panzer III's. But armor-piercing weapons were only useful in combat against other tanks. In action against infantry in buildings and artillery targets, tanks needed to fire a high explosive round to kill the unprotected men and disable the guns. The velocity, the speed of the shell, was relatively unimportant. But the bigger the shell, the bigger the explosion. So large caliber guns were preferable. In this rare piece of footage, we can see how slowly high explosive shells actually traveled. In slow motion, we can clearly see the shell leaving this German self-propelled gun as it flies towards its target. 
The explosion is no less impressive for the slow speed of the projectile. To achieve this destructive power and a tank killing capability, a balanced tank force needed a mix of both anti-tank and high explosive capability. In the opposing armies of 1939, two different solutions were found. The Germans developed two separate types of tanks, each specialized for a particular job. The first were the tank killers, equipped with a high-velocity anti-tank gun with a longer barrel of smaller caliber. Most of the Panzer III's of 1939 were mainly equipped with this gun, designed to deal with enemy tanks. All of the heavier Panzer IVs, and even some Panzer III's, were designed as infantry support tanks. They were equipped with a short-barreled gun of higher caliber, ideal for firing high explosives. The Panzer IV, when it first arrived in North Africa, and the Panzer III latterly, had a short 75mm gun in the turret. This gun was designed to fire high explosive and it therefore served in what's known as the close support role. That means the tank stays close to the infantry and uses the gun to deal with the kind of opposition they've got to face, machine gun positions, blockhouses and light artillery. It is not really to be judged as an anti-tank weapon in the same way as say the British two-pounder or the American 75. However, it had an anti-tank round which was immensely effective. But it's a question really of the use a tank is meant to be put to and this tank was designed specifically to deal with those targets that the high-velocity anti-tank gun can't cope with. In contrast to the Germans who had two types of tanks, one solution tried by the armies of both France, America and Russia was to house two types of gun in the same tank. This produced the massive multi-turreted tanks like the Char B and the Lee Grant tank. The dual turret idea was a failure an evolutionary blind alley, which was cruelly exposed on the battlefield. The two turrets made the tank difficult to operate. It was impossible to coordinate the guns, and the sheer size of the machines presented a huge target that was difficult to miss. With the figure of her commander perched some 15 feet above the ground, it is easy to see why this Lee Grant could not be successfully hidden on the battlefield. The main gun on the General Grant is a 75mm weapon, which not only fires solid armour-piercing shot, but can also fire high explosive rounds. And this was the answer to Rommel's tactics of mixing tanks and anti-tank guns. You've got solid shot for dealing with the enemy tanks, and you can fire high explosive rounds and lob them near to the enemy anti-tank gun, which will disable the crew or put them off their stroke for a while. The disadvantage on this particular tank design is that the main gun is down here in the hull. You can see there's a conventional anti-tank gun in it, but this is the gun that does the business. And having it low down in the hull is a handicap when we come to talk about the hull down position. In other words, you're using ground to hide the body of the tank and just fighting the gun looking over the ridge. It is quite clear from the height of this tank and the position of this gun that there'll be a lot of tanks sticking up in the air when it's trying to hide behind a ridge and shell an enemy position. So from a pure design point of view, this is not the best place to put a tank's gun. Compare the large and ungainly Grant with the sleek form of this late war German tank killer and the advantages soon become apparent. A low silhouette which presented a squat target was difficult to hit and sloping armor deflected shots away from the vehicle. As the war progressed, the same course was ultimately adopted by all sides, which was to combine both an anti-tank capability and an infantry support role in one vehicle by mounting the largest possible high-velocity gun. The larger caliber effectively gave it a good high-explosive firing capability, as well as a deadly killing power against other tanks. In the Polish campaign of September 1939, the German generals would have loved to have such excellent tanks. Nonetheless, they were still able to provide a quick and complete victory for Hitler despite extreme reservations about the suitability of the available tank designs and the limitations of the new tactics. Guderian was prepared to stick his neck out for the tank and the Blitzkrieg against very considerable opposition. And it's very important to realize that, you know, the tank wasn't readily adopted. The idea of, of the Blitzkrieg wasn't taken to the bosom of the German high command. Quite the contrary.
and therefore Guderian really had to push it very hard indeed and became, of course, in the course of the Second World War, if you like, the, uh, the master of the German tank arm and saw it through its early trials and into most of its major successes and its decline as well. Despite the concerns of the generals, Hitler had triumphed in Poland. Now his gambling instincts ran unchecked. Hitler turned his attentions to the invasion of France and his generals grew nervous. They knew that this time there would surely be no repeat of the easy victory won in Poland. Hitler's combination of political brinkmanship and calculated gambles had disguised the fact that the German army at this time could deploy only 2,000 tanks. The British and French could count on 4,500. Not only were their numbers inferior, but many of the tanks deployed by the Germans were of limited fighting value. As we have seen, one of the main offenders in this respect was the tiny Panzer I light tank. Seen here in Bovington, this machine still bears the evidence of the shells fired through the hull which disabled it. The ease with which the thin armor of the Panzer I could be penetrated had been cruelly exposed in Poland, but some 520 machines still had to be engaged for the coming invasion of France. There was simply no alternative. Of far greater military value was the Panzer IV, then one of the best tanks in the world. But in 1940, only 200 of these machines were available, which meant that the best and most heavily armored tank available to the Wehrmacht accounted for less than 10% of the tank force. It was an oversight which could potentially have been disastrous, as throughout its long career, the Panzer IV was to prove a remarkably versatile design. There were those who say that if the Germans had stuck to the Panzer IV and built large numbers of them, they'd done a lot better than messing about with tanks like the Tigers and Panthers. The reason is that this was a superb all-round design. It was in service when the war broke out. It was still an effective frontline tank at the end. And the reason is that the Germans built expandability into the design. Its armor thickness increases two or three times over the wartime period, and that does not affect the tank's performance at all, although it's getting heavier. And the gun, although it doesn't increase in caliber, certainly increases in size from a short-barreled 75 to this long 75, which enabled it to keep pace with developments on the other side. In other words, we would come up with tanks like the Cromwell and the Sherman, by upgunning the Panzer IV, the Germans kept pace with us and in some ways were that bit ahead of us. And it probably would have suited them better to have large numbers of these things in the field than mess about with the heavy tanks which, for all their other virtues, were a considerable liability on the maintenance front. Taken together with the Mark III and IV, the German tank force on the eve of the decisive battle in France deployed 500 Panzer I's, 1,000 Panzer II's, 350 Panzer III's, 200 Panzer IV's, and 400 of the Czech-manufactured Panzer XXXVIII T's. This very high proportion of light tanks would have proved hopelessly inadequate later in the war. But in 1940, evolutionary forces had not yet begun to work, and the light tanks were still capable of doing the job, but only just. But as the history books testify, Hitler was to triumph as completely in France as he had done in Poland. He did so for two reasons. Firstly, there were the poor French and British tank tactics. Although some pioneering work had been done in Britain, it was the Germans who had developed Blitzkrieg to its fullest extent, with the help of their future adversary, the Russians. As the Germans began to be very well aware it was the Red Army under Tukhachevsky, under Halevsky and others who were de developing the theory of what is called deep battle. In other, in other words, operations for deep penetration using a combination of tank troops and airborne troops and, if you like, uh, motorized infantry. So I think it's a little unfair to 
um, ascribe all of this to Littlehart and to Fuller. It was, in many respects, uh, the practical experience which the Germans acquired in Russia, which I would regard as being perhaps the most decisive and even more important, the Russians at the same time were wor working out very, very complex theoretical backgrounds to this. So there was a co coincidence, if you like, of the German interest and commitment and, and Soviet practice. One other significant factor which led to the German victory in 1940 was that the superior French tanks were distributed in small contingents throughout the army. The German tanks, on the other hand, were concentrated together in the new panzer divisions, superbly led by able commanders. The combination of efficient battlefield tactics and inspired leadership made the difference for Hitler. But it served to disguise the many weaknesses which existed in the tank designs themselves. By the time these flaws were discovered, mercifully, for the rest of humanity, it would be too late. The German army in 39-40 was not particularly more mechanized than, say, the French army. But they made great use of being able to concentrate their forces. Much of the logistics was horse-drawn. They could range far and wide, but whenever they had to move their bases forward, much of their supplies, including the fuel, had to come in by horse. Uh, the result is that uh, the, the pace of their ability to move their operations eastward was much diminished. During 1941, the real weaknesses of the German tank designs were still not discovered. Several false conclusions were drawn from the conquest of the Balkans and Greece. These easy victories supported the continued German belief that their tanks were the best in the world. Although the design work that was to lead to the Tiger had begun, there was little real urgency. Up to the summer of 1941, Germany's main adversary had been Britain, and British tank design lagged behind Germany's. In the North African campaign, the poor performance of the British Crusader tanks only gave fresh support to the German view that the Panzer III and IVs were at least equal to anything the Allies could throw at them. The Crusader was particularly badly designed, and it was plagued by a host of mechanical failures. Eventually, the British Army lost faith in their own tanks altogether. And in 1943, when the victorious British and American forces embarked from Africa for the invasion of Italy, all of the British tanks were left behind. Now, the Crusader is arguably one of the worst tanks Britain ever produced. It was a cruiser tank. That means it was designed to travel fast and relied on its speed far rather than its armour thickness for protection. The drawback was it was also chronically unreliable and breakdowns became almost endemic. I am quite convinced that one of the reasons that the British Army only took American tanks to Italy in 1943 was that the standard of reliability of the British machines they used in the desert, particularly as personified by the Crusader, had really actually put them off. And therefore, tanks like the Grant that we've seen and the Sherman, which followed it, were reliable and therefore far more acceptable to British troops. Despite the limitations of machines like the Crusader, in North Africa, the signs were there of the dangerous flaws in Germany's tank capability. In the relative backwater of the Desert War, even the unspectacular British Matilda tank was considered a success against the Italian forces and frequently held its own against the Germans. The gun on the Matilda, which is typical of most tanks of this period, is the two-pounder, a 40-millimeter weapon, but it only fired solid shot. In other words, it was only any use firing against enemy tanks. This was fine under those circumstances, but once the Germans came to the desert and started mixing tanks and anti-tank guns in the attack, you needed a dual-purpose gun, something that not only fired solid shot to take out enemy tanks, but could also fire high explosive shells. And that sort of advantage comes in at last when we get the American tanks over, notably the General Grant. Once again, superior German battlefield tactics were overcoming the limitations of her armoured forces but these successes also reinforced a leisurely attitude towards the development of new types. In 1941, the evolution of German tank design was proceeding much too slowly, and it was to have deadly consequences from which Germany would never recover. The shock was to be delivered 
in Russia. When Hitler ordered the conquest of Russia in the summer of 1941, confidence among the Panzer Force was at an all-time high. The desert war was progressing well, and the German tactics of mixing tank and anti-tank forces together concealed the deficiencies in tank design from the Germans themselves. Despite the understandable cockiness of the German high command, a few lessons from earlier campaigns had been absorbed and the makeup of the tank force which shook Stalin to the core had a much higher proportion of the heavier Mark III and IV tanks instead of the lightweight Panzer I and IIs. This trend illustrated the steadily increasing reliance on heavier armor which was to continue throughout the war. It was just as well because the Wehrmacht was about to meet with a very nasty surprise. After a few weeks of the campaign in which the German armor had faced only obsolete Russian tanks, such as the lumbering T-28 and the outdated BT-7, the German forces suddenly encountered two of the new Russian tanks, which were to change the course of the war. The first was the heavy KV-1, a 46-ton monster with superior heavy armor and a vicious 76mm gun capable of destroying any German tank from most ranges on the battlefield. In 1941, it was a deadly adversary. The Soviet KV-1 is a fine example of a tank made for specific conditions. Broad tracks for dealing with mud and snow and a diesel engine for operating in the coldest possible weather. In 1941, when it first appeared, it was a superb design and absolutely dominated the battlefield. But by the time Kursk came, it was beginning to get outclassed. The Tigers and the Panthers, with their thicker armor and enormous guns, could take it out at ranges beyond which it simply couldn't fight back. The other unpleasant surprise for Germans was the arrival of the T-34, a medium tank far better armed and equipped than the German Mark IV. It was also better equipped to deal with the extreme Russian weather conditions. Its wide tracks made it equally at home in the dry, in mud, or in snow. In addition, the sloping armor presented an angled front to German fire, designed to cause shells to glance off the armor. The T-34 was to become the real nemesis of the German army. It was built for mass assembly, and the crude welding lines can be clearly seen. It was no beauty, but it was tough, and it possessed a superb inbuilt ability to be upgraded. Now the T-34 was probably one of the finest tank designs of the Second World War. You have, for a start, one of the first tanks to be fitted with sloped armor, which, in defensive terms, is excellent. But the great thing about T-34 was the way it was capable of improvement, and I cannot illustrate it any better than by the guns here. When the T-34 first appeared in service, it was fitted with a 76mm gun and had a two-man crew in the turret. By 1944, they had not only upgunned it to take an 85mm weapon, they'd increased the turret size to enable it to take three men, and that makes it a far more efficient tank on the battlefield. Nobody else achieved that throughout the war, and that alone would single the T-34 out as one of the most outstanding tanks of all time. Although the Germans would devise better tanks, they could never hope to compete in terms of the sheer numbers of T-34s. The T-34 was the most prolific tank of the Second World War. And when you consider that the Soviets achieved that and moved their tank producing facilities right across the country under German pressure, it really is remarkable. Just inspect the tank closely and you'll see how crude it is. The workmanship would make the average British or American factory worker weep, but that doesn't worry the Russians at all. They are out to produce as many crude, hard, tough fighting tanks as possible. And in the T-34, they achieved it. No doubt about that at all. It was by no means the best tank to emerge from World War II, but it was more than adequate for the task. And the huge numbers manufactured would ultimately tip the balance of the whole war. It was now, almost too late, that the German High Command began to urgently request new tanks with superior armor and more effective guns to combat the KV-1 and T-34. A new 
heavy tank was needed urgently, but it wouldn't be available for at least a year. To compound matters, mistaken assessments based on experience in France had led to even the heaviest German tank, the Mark IV, being equipped with short barreled 75mm guns. While Germany scrambled to produce their new heavy tanks, the Mark IVs were urgently re-equipped with long barreled 75mm guns. Extra welded steel skirts were also added as a defense against the new Russian hollow charge weapons. Measures like these helped to keep up the momentum of the German advance in 1942. But the Panzer divisions were increasingly hard pressed by the growing numbers of T-34s and KV-1s. What the Russians had uh, tried to do was to bring in two new tanks, the T-34, which actually was the tank which had been tested in 39, and the rather heavier tank, uh, the Klimvara Shilov. But they'd only produced uh, about a thousand of each, so therefore these uh, T-34s were, di were, were distributed in very small packets. Uh, and remember, the battlefront is about 2,000 miles long, so what do you do with a thousand tanks? On the other hand, it did come as an enormous shock the first time that the Germans encountered the T-34 because the T-34's armor, mobility, speed, and gunpowder was something they simply hadn't suspected. And Guderian, as you will remember, actually, in no November 1941, ran into a T-34 ambush and was completely destroyed, the German units. It was then, actually, that the Germans began to realize they were up against something which they had not realized. Develop such a machine, and in 1941, one stopgap measure was to increase the production of assault guns or turretless tanks. This is a machine called a Sturmgeschütz. It's basically a Panzer III chassis with the gun fitted into a superstructure rather than the turret. There's two big advantages. One, it's quicker and cheaper to produce. And secondly, you can actually fit a far larger gun than you'd be able to fit into a turret on the same hull. The disadvantage, of course, is that the thing cannot deal in open battle with its enemies like a tank can. It can't swing a turret round to fire. It's got to swing the whole vehicle round. In 1941, the puny 50mm gun was still the standard anti-tank armament for German tanks. The experience of tank ace Hermann Bix was typical of the desperate straits many German tank commanders now found themselves in. Bix saw a dozen of his shells bounce off this KV-1 even at the closest ranges. Eventually, he managed to silence the steel monster as it swung its turret to take aim against him by the expedient of a well-aimed shot deliberately fired through the barrel of his opponent's gun. Men like Bix were part of a new breed of German tank commanders who achieved incredible victories against superior Russian forces. But these superior forces were now also armed with better equipment and a deadly race would develop between the Russian capacity to manufacture more tanks against the Germans' ability to engineer better tanks. Although the German engineers would prove themselves winners, they were let down by their manufacturing capacity. The German war effort was being run inefficiently, and by 1942, Germany was being targeted by wave after wave of Allied bombers, which were reducing her war industries to rubble while Stalin had wisely moved his factories back into the interior of Russia, out of harm's way. They had managed to move out considerable elements of um, tank factories and uh, aircraft factories. For example, the Kharkov uh, tractor works, which produced tanks, they managed to get that out. The workers in that factory walked along the railway line under German gunfire to get in the trains to be moved out. They got the equipment out, then they took the workers out. It was the largest industrial migration in the history of the world. Well over, I think it's about 1,900 plants were moved eastwards. During 1942, the Red Army's armada of T-34s was growing ominously. New Russian tank armies were coming into being, and in the wake of the terrible defeat at Stalingrad, the German soldiers prayed for an answer. In the winter of 1942, the answer to their prayers was finally ready for delivery. It was the Panzerkampfwagen 6, the Tiger. Well, the Tiger 1 has got to be seen as a quantum leap in the progress of tank design. It appeared in 1942, and in one swoop, it doubled in armor thickness, doubled in weight, and doubled in gunpowder 
the might of any tank on the battlefield. It was really a terrific leap forward in tank design. Of course, in doing this, the Germans paid a tremendous price. The tank is so heavy that it made it difficult to control. You've got an engine which really isn't 100% powerful enough for the kind of weight it was pushing about, and they had a lot of technical problems just keeping it on the battlefield. So for all their advances and their immense power, the Tiger was a terrific liability to its crew. The Tiger tank had been developed in 1940 and 1941, too late to benefit from all of the lessons from the Russian war. So it had the uncompromisingly flat armor at the front, which didn't deflect shots away from the vehicle. Sloping armor, like the T-34, would have been preferable. But the Tiger was so very heavily armored that even this problem was overcome. In fact, the Tiger was almost impervious to most Russian guns at all but the closest ranges, and it carried the deadly 88mm gun, then the best weapon on the battlefield. Inside his heavily armored turret, the gunner of the Tiger lined his target up on the middle triangle of his gun sight as the motorized turret effortlessly swung the gun into position. I guess it had been delivered by the end of January 1943. Already they were credited with over 400 kills. In the spring of that year, the Germans extended their use to North Africa, and the Western Allies grew nervous. In the space of just two short years, it seemed the Germans had evolved the ultimate battlefield weapon. To compound matters, no Tiger had yet been captured. That situation was to change early in 1943, when British forces fighting in Tunisia knocked out and captured this machine, which is currently undergoing restoration in the Tank Museum at Bovington. The particular history of this one is that it was issued to the 501st Heavy Tank Battalion of the German Army and shipped to Tunisia early in 1943. It came up against 48th Royal Tank Regiment during the fighting in Tunisia. And 48th Royal Tanks were then in Churchill's, armed with a 57mm gun, which is against an 88 on this thing. But some fluke shot from one of the Churchill tanks actually struck the Tiger underneath its gun barrel, embedded itself in the turret ring, caused the crew to panic, leap out and abandon the tank. Now, that really is exceptional. Those tanks were so powerful they could have dealt with Churchill's without any problem at all, way out of the range that the Churchills could fight back. The shot from the Churchill tank strikes the Tiger just underneath its gun barrel. Little gouge there, another one in the base of the mantlet, and then the shot buries itself in the turret ring of the Tiger, and it jams it. And that is enough to shake the confidence of the crew, despite the thickness of armor, despite the size of the gun, they are actually nervous about being hit by another tank and they abandon it. And that way, this perfect example of one of the strongest tanks of the Second World War falls into British hands. In 1943, this object of fascination was studied by no less than Winston Churchill and King George VI. The tank was the subject of an urgent British Army study. Every inch of the Tiger was inspected and a very concerned study team presented their findings. It was noted that the Tiger, with its heavy armor, dual-purpose armament, and first-class fighting ability, was basically an excellent tank, and constituted a considerable advance on any Allied tank. The study revealed its only real weaknesses were the limits imposed on mobility due to its weight, width, and limited range of action. But the study concluded that overall, the Tiger presented a very formidable fighting machine, which could not be underrated. There was more bad news for the Allies. In tandem with the Tiger, the German armaments industry had also been developing a new medium tank to match the T-34. It would be ready in 1943. Although they would not admit it, many of the features of the new Panzerkampfwagen 5, or Panther, were copied directly from the T-34. The Panther had the same sloping armor, wide tracks, and a similar 75mm gun. Developed with breakneck speed and rushed into production, the Panther made its debut at the Battle of Kursk before they were really proven. Engine and transmission problems abounded. Engine fires were commonplace, 
Dozens broke down, and some vehicles went into their first action, pouring fire from the exhaust pipes. Not surprising, the advent of the Panther and the Tiger represented almost the end of the evolutionary trail in World War II. German tank sizes had steadily increased from the six-ton Panzer I through the 22-ton Panzer III and now onto the 62-ton Tiger. It would reach a peak with the 70-ton Tiger B, or King Tiger. The weight and superior armor certainly made the difference, but quality had been achieved at the expense of quantity, and it was quantity which Germany needed. It has been estimated that from May 1944 until the end of the war, on any given day, on average, only 400 tanks were available for action in the entire German army. The Allies could call on some 20,000. With this tremendous disparity in numbers, it has been estimated that in the East, the German tank divisions would have to have destroyed 10 Russian tanks for every one of their own which was lost. In fact, by the end of the war, it is estimated that five Russian tanks were destroyed for every German tank. But it was never enough to affect the huge numerical superiority enjoyed by the Allies. Even on the Western Front, four Allied tanks were being destroyed for every German machine lost. For the Western Allies, the solution was very much the same as the Russians. It was to abandon the search for radical advances, take a simple, workable design and manufacture it in vast quantities. While the Russians had the T-34, the Allied option was the Sherman. This was the main battle tank of the Western Allies. It had numerous flaws, chief among them its very high profile, which made an easy target. But it was available in huge numbers. So many Shermans were manufactured that they were even shipped to the east to help the Russian war effort. The Russian response was politely muted, as the Sherman never matched the standards of the T-34. Even when it was upgraded to include a high-velocity 85mm weapon, the tank was really no match for the Tiger. As further proof of the Sherman's weakness, it is interesting to note that only a small proportion of German tanks were actually destroyed by the Sherman. The vast majority either fell victim to Allied fighter bombers or had to be abandoned and destroyed by their crews when they experienced mechanical difficulties or, more frequently, ran out of fuel. From 1944, the Allied bombing campaigns were really beginning to bite, and the shortage of fuel and spare parts was killing the Panzer formations as effectively as the Allied armies. One thing the Panzer divisions did have on their side was experience. And before they were swept away, the small groups of Tigers performed heroically. One man will always be associated with the Tiger. He was Michael Wittmann of the 1st SS Panzer Division. Wittmann was responsible for a huge number of Allied tank kills. By June 1944, Wittmann and his Tiger had been responsible for more than 130 Russian tanks when he was transferred to the Western Front. Despite the skills of men like these, the Tigers were still being destroyed as fast as they were being delivered, and Wittmann himself fell in action in August 1944, his machine totally destroyed. Such losses were simply unsustainable. In 1944, despite the pressures of the Allied bombing raids, some 20,000 German armoured fighting vehicles were manufactured. But battlefield losses were running at some 23,000 machines. So the number of German tanks available in 1944 at the front line actually fell. During 1944, on average, there were never more than 70 Tigers available for action at any given time on the whole of the Russian front. The remaining machines were either under short or long-term repair. It was this tiny force which forged a legend. On the Western Front, 
The Allies by now enjoyed total air supremacy, and the Allied Air Force was able to rove at will, destroying German aircraft on the ground. The high rate of attrition on their armored force caused the Germans to cast around desperately for a solution. One successful expedient was to dispose with the turret of the new Panther tanks to produce turretless vehicles with less flexibility, but with heavier firepower. They were also easier and quicker to manufacture. Three could be made for every two tanks. These tank killers were known by the German name, Jagdpanther. By this stage of the war, German armor was fighting almost exclusively defensive battles, for which the Jagdpanthers were perfectly suited. They could lie in wait, firing from fixed positions. The Jagdpanther shown here is from the Imperial War Museum. It has had the side removed to permit the public to view the inside, but the sense of military efficiency still remains. It too bears the scars of the armor-piercing shells which disabled it in 1945. As with the turretless tanks, there was also a steady increase in size and armament in the tank hunters, which evolved from the simple Marder I, based on the Panzer I, to the ultimate tank killing machine, the Jag Tiger, based on the upgraded Tiger II. Massive armor and a superb high caliber gun made these machines deadly. But once again, the design and engineering effort took valuable resources away from producing simpler designs in the volume the Germans needed. The last Panzer to see active service was the moving fortress which was the upgraded Tiger B, or King Tiger. It carried the huge 88mm high-velocity gun. But only 470 of these machines were ever manufactured, never enough to seriously affect the tidal wave of armor now encroaching Germany on every side. But the Tiger and Tiger B still made a large impact in the closing months of the war. Now, the Tiger II is a remarkable tank by any standards. A bigger and more powerful gun than the Tiger I, and the armor is thicker and sloped, giving it a tremendous advantage. And when you think this tank came into service in 1944, it really looks almost good enough to use today. It's a considerable tribute to the German designers. The trouble is, it's getting near the limit of weight that the engine and transmission can stand, and, of course, producing a tank like this under wartime conditions is a tremendous strain, especially when the industry is being heavily bombed. Therefore, although you could say that in terms of gunpowder and armor, it way outclasses tanks such as the T-34, it was never available in enough numbers, and it certainly wasn't easy to ship around the country in a hurry to get to trouble spots, and in that sense, has to be regarded as a failure in terms of tank design. The Tiger B was the largest practical tank to see action in the Panzer divisions. Already, its huge size was giving enormous difficulty in negotiating narrow roads and moving across bridges, few of which could carry its huge weight. It also needed huge stocks of the vital fuel supplies, which Germany could no longer provide. But in 1945, when the war ended, Germany was developing the Super Heavy Panzer VII, a huge metal monster, massively armored and sporting a huge main gun. In an untypically humorous moment, this machine, designed to lead the Nazi war machine, was given the jokey nickname, the Mouse. The Mouse was never to see action, and only four prototypes were built. But it seemed that the crazed minds of the Third Reich would never give up the quest to be the best and the biggest, whatever the cost. But as the humble T-34 had proved, in evolution, Sometimes quantity matters as much as quality.